Good morning. This is uh, the session number nine on discipleship within the church. And you can see this, uh, the iceberg up here. And then this is only the part that is above water. The part that is below water is a lot bigger than what we can actually see physically above. So today's session on uh, discipleship, on session nine, Christ Esteem in Emotions Part 2 will have something to do with uh, this illustration here. So we look at the importance of emotions and thoughts. We see from last week that God created human beings with the ability to feel, right? We can feel in two ways. We can feel physically through our body. So we have the senses, yeah, for example, the touch. And then, and also feel emotionally in our inner man. So there's the physical part outside to relate to our tangible world. And there's also the emotional part that is inside us, our personal inner man. And so in this way, we can understand what is happening around us and also within us. And this will enable us to take responsive action. We can do something and then we can develop as individuals. Right, the, the fact that there's something happening outside that we can relate to, to ourselves on the inside. We can respond, we can do something about it. And from there, we can develop as people. The emotions that we experience, they are very important because they reveal something about ourselves. Emotions are not there just for us to react to. If we pay attention to what they are saying, our emotions actually enable us to feel, then to know and relate to things, people, experiences, and what is happening in our own inner state. Right? So that means inside us, something is happening and our emotions are actually able to let us know what. Let's take a look at the Bible characters' experiences that we have introduced last week, okay, to be able to uh, understand what, what I just mentioned here, the emotions that we experience, okay, actually tell us what is happening within us in our inner state. So we can discover uh, their negative emotions, and in that sense, when we look at the Bible characters' experiences to discover their emotions, negative ones, we can also think back on ourselves. Okay, then what their negative emotions were actually telling them. Okay, so negative emotions are telling them something. Uh, whether they paid attention or not, of course, is another matter. But the emotions are speaking and telling them something. And what the negative emotions meant, or another way of looking at it is what the negative emotions revealed about the characters. So in a way, our negative emotions are revealing to us something about ourselves. Okay? If we learn to understand them, then we will be able to understand ourselves. And what the people did Okay, they had the emotions, but what did they do? Did they respond appropriately? And what they should have done? So that's, this part here, point D, is two things. The actual actions they did, as well as what they should have done instead. Okay, so let's backtrack to Adam and Eve all the way to the very first human beings on earth. Okay, so what better people than actually the first human beings, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're not reading Genesis 3, 6 to 10, but that is something you can read back and refer for yourself uh, when you download the, this video and take the time to spend uh, more reflectively on what we are covering during this lesson, okay? So it's good to download the video and reflect uh, more carefully and slowly to 
have an idea of self-understanding. So when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and their eyes were opened, they realized they were naked. And the emotions they felt included guilt and shame. So mankind experienced two emotions. Okay, the first two emotions they felt were guilt and shame. I think somebody may need to mute yourself. Okay, so their negative emotions and what they were, the emotions were telling them, that's this column, what it meant or what it revealed, and then what the characters did and what they should have done on this third column. So, starting with the left column, after they ate the fruit, Adam and Eve felt guilt. So what was guilt telling them? That they were they had done something wrong. Something they should not have done. And that is to give in to temptation, disobey God and eat the fruit. And shame was telling them that it was not okay. It was not right for them to be naked. So these two emotions what did the two emotions mean or what did they reveal? Well, it shows that they gave in to the serpent's temptation. Yeah, that's the guilt. The first thing was they fell into temptation and this temptation caused them not to trust God because God told them, don't eat the fruit or you will surely die. And they listened to the temptation of the serpent and they followed that temptation instead of trusting God said that they would die. Uh, if you remember, the serpent told them, you will not surely die. He contradicted God. So the next thing it means or reveals is that they betrayed God's trust in them by eating the fruit they did not they showed that they were not uh, they were not faithful to God's trust in them and finally it of course proved that they disobeyed God. So the guilt and the shame showed these things that they something was wrong, they had done something wrong and these are the things. Now what did they do as a result of eating the fruit and feeling the guilt and shame? Well, they sewed fig leaves to cover up the naked bodies, uh, but you know that did not change or it did not address the damage caused by falling into temptation, uh, their trust issue with God and their betrayal. And of course, it did not address the disobedience issues that they had already uh, shown in their action. That's what they did. Now, what should they have done? They should have owned up to God and apologized for their mistake or disobedience. And today's term would be repented. They didn't repent. So when God came looking for them, the third action or the next thing they did was they hid from God because they were afraid. So their afraid is fear. Their fear was telling them they could no longer face God because they had disobeyed him. Their relationship with God had been broken. So that's quite common, you know, even with between a child and a parent. When a child disobeys a parent, okay, initially, if the child's conscience is still alive, still, still active and still working, you know, we can desensitize our conscience by ignoring them or damping them until they are dead. But Initially, our conscience is still alive and a child, when disobeying a parent, conscience will cause them to have some fear or worry of some kind, right? Because they disobeyed the parent. So same thing here. They were fearful because they could no longer face God. And what did it reveal? They did not know what to expect. That is, they didn't know the consequences now. And so, it revealed fear of the unknown. What is going to happen to us? What God would do to them? They really could not tell because God said, you eat the fruit, you will die. But they don't know what is dying. 
Okay, so what did they do? They hid from God and they did not hope for or try a repair of relationship issues. What they should have done is faced up to their fear, right? Because it's very common in us that when we have fear, we tend to run, we tend to run, we tend to hide, we tend to cover up, yeah? Uh, so they should have faced up to their fear very bravely, which is challenging. We should know because I'm sure we have done this before. Our fear made us run away. So they should have faced up to their fear and met God as usual. Met God as usual. Now they did not meet God. They went to hide. Or they should have sought God out with an apology to mend their relationship if possible. Hiding didn't change and it didn't improve anything. In fact, it would estrange them, you know, separate themselves from God even further. And here's one truth. Hiding protects secrets that distance people from each other. There is a divide. Yes, when we have secrets, when we hide, the secret will cause a division, even though it is invisible and unspoken, so that they continue to be distant or separate from each other. So that's the thing about hiding and that's the thing about secrets. People become a little bit distant in that particular area. Now we can see guilt, fear and shame make people run, make people hide, make people cover up and even give excuses. Later, when answering to God, when God spoke to them and asked them what they did for their personal action, they gave excuses. Adam and Eve, each one gave excuses and they did it by blaming someone else. Adam said, the woman you gave me made me eat that fruit. So he blamed Eve and then Eve would blame the serpent. So that's, that's what we do in our guilt, fear and shame. Their negative emotions also reveal the self-righteousness within. Yeah, there is a sense of like, Actually, I'm not totally wrong, you know, because I did this due to somebody else. Yeah, so there's a sense of self-righteousness coming up from within where they try to protect and preserve their self-esteem and the personal pride, okay? And of course, sense of personal worth. I'm not that bad. It's because of Eve. The woman you gave me that, you know, I did this wrong thing. And she would say, I'm not that bad either. It's because of that serpent that I did this wrong thing. So blame the other one. So that's what happened. And that's what we can see the revelation if we actually take the time, right, to think about what it's showing us. But of course, what they did and should have done were two separate things. They did not... They, what they did and should have done did not match. So we move on to the next generation, to Cain, and you can read uh, this episode in Genesis 4, verses 3 to 9, for this aspect of their emotions, uh, Cain's emotions and what he did. Huh? So Cain, on his part, he was angry, he was downcast when God did not receive him and his offering with favor. So his negative emotions and what they were telling him, anger, first one. Yeah, now it's very common. A lot of people have anger issues. So Cain's anger was telling him that he felt or he perceived God did not treat him well, even though he brought God an offering. He made an offering. Why is God treating me so badly, so unfairly? He was unfairly compared to Abel. And God favoured Abel over him. God is unfair. Then his downcast feeling. Downcast, there are a lot of synonyms. Can be disappointed, sad, disillusioned, uh, hopeless. Okay, sense of hopelessness. So his downcast feeling was telling him that he was sad or disheartened, discouraged to be rejected by God. That's what happens to us, right? When we, when we feel that people are rejecting us, we feel discouraged. We feel disheartened. 
and we feel sad. That was King. Yeah, so we can understand his feeling if we have gone through these life experiences. And he was the first person that we know from the Bible telling us about that. So what did his emotions, negative emotions mean and what did they reveal? Well, the anger part showed or meant he could not accept God's rejection. He was disappointed, dot, dot, dot. There are a lot of other feelings that we can probably add on, yeah? If you have ever been in something similar before, you feel rejected, you feel disappointed, you feel disillusioned. How come God is like that? You know, so all these emotions with God's response to him. And his downcast feeling was uh, reveal his doubt about God. Was God being fair to him and biased toward Abel? Right? So you see, our feelings can lead us to behave and think and probably respond to things that are not very positive. What did he do? He went to brood when he was angry and downcast that God did not receive him and his offering with favor. He went to brood. Now, brood means engage in deep thought, so deep thinking, the, the thoughts there, in something that makes one sad, angry, worried, etc. So there you see that brooding combines negative thoughts with resulting negative emotions. So brooding is a word that combines both the thoughts of the mind as well as the feelings of our emotions. And normally, it tends to be negative. That's what he did. So he spent the time thinking and feeling lousy. And what should he have done? Well, in his thoughts, he should have reflected why God reacted so unfavorably to him, but not to Abel. God actually looked at Abel with favor, but not him. So he should have reflected why. God was unfavorable towards me rather than getting upset. Okay, I think it's normal. Some people will say, yeah, but you normally will feel upset, what, won't you? Yes, it is normal. We'll feel upset. But then once the initial upset is over, then we should kick in with our rational thinking. What happened? Yeah, we like to ask why, but we don't think about why as in reflecting on ourselves. We like to think of why as in the other party did this, God allowed this, God did this, and it's not good, it's not right because I'm feeling uh, negative reactions. Okay, so he should have also been honest to admit his own wrong worship attitude and offering. Yes, so the basic problem started with himself something inside him. In the first place, he should have given God the right and acceptable offerings that he did not. So that was the problem. It was about himself. It wasn't about God or Abel. Then after God spoke to him, you know, God spoke to him and he was privileged because God actually went to him personally to address him. And God told him, what was the problem? And he continued to be angry and blame his brother for his plight. His continued anger was telling him that he could not accept the truth. And he was not going to give up being wrong. Okay, so there you go. Could not accept the truth and not going to give up being wrong. So this is quite often people's problems. We can't accept the fact that we are the one in the wrong and then we don't stop being in the wrong. We continue to persist in our wrong. What did it reveal? Well, when God spoke to him to show him, he did not appreciate God talking to him because he didn't do anything about what God told him. God asked him, why are you angry? Why are you downcast. And God told him more things besides asking questions. Okay? And so you can read 
it for yourself when you look at Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7. Why are you angry? God said to Cain. Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Okay? You don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. So God gave questions and God gave him important information. But he did not respond to God's feedback to him. He did not appreciate God talking to him. He was stubborn and refused to reflect on his dangerous spiritual position where sin wanted to master him, wanted to have him. It desires to have you. And then he refused to correct himself, showing he was unrepentant. So these are things that we can see about our ourselves from our emotions. And what else did we do or not do? Okay, so what did he do and what should he have done? Well, we see he brooded. Yeah, just now we said, and then he should have reflected. And then after God spoken to him, he entertained negative thoughts because he made a plan and he also entertained self-justification. And in this plan, he planned premeditated murder. That means it was not impulsive murder of the brother. It was premeditated. He actually had enough time to plan and wait. And during this whole, during this whole time of plan and wait, okay, it, me it means that he held back long enough to both of them were in the field before he finally killed his brother. So the holding back actually has a lot of time where he should have stopped himself and changed his behavior and response. And so what he should have done was examined his own attitude. His attitude was wrong. Whatever God told him and warned him, he didn't care. He didn't do anything about it. And the negative emotions and action in his offering after God spoke to him, he should have examined everything, right? Including his negative emotions. Because God said, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? He didn't examine his anger and his downcast feelings. So they continued to eat him up. Yeah, they continued to eat him up and disturb him until he came up with a plan to kill his brother. He should have reflected on the whole episode of his offering and attitude. He should have given God the right offering and attitude either at the beginning, before God spoke to him, or at least after God told him he would be accepted if, if he had done the right thing. So what we can see about anger, okay, front, face front from the episode of Cain. Anger is an emotion response or a feeling. Okay, it's a reaction, a feeling reaction that something is not right or fair. Okay, you just think of yourself when you are angry with somebody or you're angry about something. Isn't it because you feel that something is not right or not fair? Correct? Or there's something else called expectation. Okay? There's something else called expectation, which we will talk about in a little while. So something is not right, something is not fair, and I have certain expectation. And anger causes someone to feel self-righteous and justify their thoughts and actions. So in our anger, we feel that, why did you do that? You should have done this. And it's not right to me. I don't like it. Yeah, so I don't like it. I prefer this thing. You should have done this thing because that's the way I would do it. Okay, so a lot of all this kind of stuff will go through us. We'll be self-righteous. We'll justify our thoughts, our actions, even our attitudes. Okay, maybe I can put that down. Justify our thoughts, actions, attitudes, especially when they don't resolve it in a 
godly manner. Okay, so what this sentence is trying to say here is that we feel self-righteous and justify all that we feel and think uh, when we don't resolve it in a godly manner. Okay, we're trying not to think of, is this the way God would want me to respond with my anger? Yeah, should I, should I respond with anger? Is that what God wants? Okay, so when they don't resolve it in a godly manner, all these actions and thoughts and attitudes will come up. The fact is that when a person feels angry, it does not necessarily mean the person is right. I will be repeating this a few times because, you know, this is the way we are. Very often we are angry, but it does not necessarily mean we are in the right. Okay, in fact, it means we are being very self-righteous a lot of the time. Okay, so it does not, I use the word necessarily, because sometimes, yes, we are right when we are angry, but not necessarily. So the person could be angry for the wrong logic or wrong or because of a misunderstanding or there's a wrong reason or our own personal expectation. That's why we're angry. Didn't fulfill my personal expectation. That did not materialize as I wish. And that makes the person's anger unjustified. Okay? Wrong logic that makes a person angry. That's not justified to be angry. That's a misunderstanding. So anger is not justified actually. Or there's a wrong reason. I came up with a wrong conclusion. Right? And angry for the wrong thing, for the wrong reason. And furthermore, it also makes the person wrong if he or she does not dissolve the anger. But with the anger, does something wrong or hurtful, such as by lashing out. You know, we use words, very hurting words, and sometimes we use the hurting words purposely because we want to hit out. Okay, by being hurtful, lashing out in words or actions. And of course, the attitude there is, uh, would you call malicious, wishing to hurt or harm people? Okay, uh, so words, actions, and also the attitude. Now, unresolved brooding anger. That is what Cain did. Huh? He went to uh, let his anger simmer within himself. I like to call it bozo for the Cantonese. Yeah, you, you like to uh, do your porridge simmering. So you let your anger simmer inside when it's unresolved and brooding. Okay, so brooding, remember, is thinking and feeling both combined, but negative normally. So unresolved brooding anger is nursing anger. So you're taking good care of your anger. You're keeping it, you're taking good care and you're causing it to grow. Okay, you're feeding it with negative thoughts. So you're making your anger stronger, more justified. And then it leads the person to do the wrong thing because I'm in the right one. I'm angry, ma. you know, and it causes the attitude and belief system to become cynical and hard. Yeah, without realizing, we let our anger change us inside change our attitude, change our belief system inside so that we become cynical and hard. And you know, we lose trust. And then we say, everybody's like that one. So you cannot blame me. Yeah, everybody is like that. You, can, you, you cannot say I'm wrong because they don't be like that, then I won't be like that. Lah. You know, so we become cynical and hard. And in Cain, it led to murder. And Jesus addressed this when he said, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And murder is actually your anger keeping all the way until it has fermented. Yeah, it has fermented into murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So Jesus goes all the way down to angry uh, before it becomes a murderous. Yeah, on the lower end of the continuum, when it's angry before it becomes murderous. 
That is found in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, 8. So anger at its extreme leads to murder, whether literally you kill a person or it can be emotionally or in the heart you wish the person can die, is dead. And so anger, it kills or it destroys a relationship, whether with physical murder or emotionally with the extreme of hatred or using words. Sometimes we slander people. Yeah, we say things that are not necessarily correct. We slander, which is killing people's reputation or name. See, and a lot of uh, slander happens in anger. Yeah, where we say all the wrong and not true information. So nowadays, there's a thing called fake news, right? Yeah, so this is now fake information to murder someone's reputation or name. So that is the second generation from Adam and Eve. You can see that the negative emotions are developing. Yes, uh, the range of it. So like I mentioned last week, the Pandora's box of all the negative emotions were released. Next, next person that we actually get to read about with negative emotions is Lamech, Genesis 4, 23 to 24. And Lamech was a, a Cain's descendant. He was physically wounded by the young man and he killed the young man out of his anger. So what did his negative emotions uh, telling him? First, he experienced physical pain. Okay, so this now is the tangible part of the body of being wounded. And his resulting anger issue, just like his ancestor Cain, was telling him the man was in the wrong. The man who wounded me, you know, physically wounded by the young man, that man was in the wrong. And he had the right for justice. And his brand of justice is actually vengeance to hit back at the young man. And that is revenge. Now, what did his emotions reveal? Did he did not have a sense of fairness in his brand of justice? Right? It's just like us children uh, when we were young, very common. Uh, somebody hit us one time and then we get fed up and we want to hit the person back three, four times. Yeah, because you hit me, then it's not fair. I hit you back. So I hit you back three, four times although you hit me once. So we have that sense of fairness in our brain of justice. And same for Lamech, because we are just like him. He wanted revenge, not justice. This meant he was actually not a person of true justice. Yeah, you hit me once, I hit you three times. It's not true justice. Then he took revenge. Okay, what it revealed was he took revenge by killing the man. And he was actually exalting and justifying himself to be avenged 77 times. Because God said, uh, if anybody kills Cain, Cain will be avenged seven times. But for Lamech, he said, I will be avenged 77 times. Okay, so you see that to him, he was disrespectful to God because he can do more than God. And it shows that he held God in contempt. Huh. God can only avenge you seven times. I can avenge myself 77 times. God is nothing. Okay? So he despised God. He was disrespectful to God. What did he do and what should he have done? He killed the man in his explosive rage. He should have held back till he calmed down to make a fair and just decision. He should have considered the godly form of justice and fairness to deal with the man. Okay? Yeah, so somebody may tell me, yeah, yeah, but when you're angry, you just cannot calm down. Uh, I beg to differ because last week we saw the Bible, right? That uh, many times we are told, do not be afraid, do not despair, do not fear, right? So we are shown that uh, we can be in charge of our negative emotions. It's just making the effort. Okay, so although Lamech's anger was telling him he had the right to take revenge, it was not right. And he knew it because he 
arrogantly pronounced that he would be avenged 77 times. You see, we are not totally ignorant when we are wrong. We say or do things that show we actually do have a certain awareness that we are being overboard. And it showed that he had a violent and unforgiving nature. So deep in, within himself, right? Deep within himself, he was actually violent. He was actually unforgiving. And he also had a wrong sense of justice simply because he was the victim of physical hurt. You can see how just when we are physically, uh, physically affected in some way, we can go overboard in our emotional reaction and then the actions, physical actions as well. So what did the negative emotions of the Bible characters reveal? Okay, the negative emotions that first surfaced in Adam and Eve indicated that something was not normal, something was not healthy, something was not wholesome, something was not right. So that means something has changed and it is not for the better. That's what our negative emotions are telling us, revealing to us, right? They're not, not uh, normal, healthy, wholesome, or right, as at the beginning, when they felt no shame, okay? So the first stage of their existence, there was no shame, so there was no negative emotions. The negative emotions arose because they had done something not right. So normally, negative emotions will arise because something not right has happened. It may be within ourselves, okay? And that would be in our inner man. We'll talk about it another time. Uh, but quite often, negative emotions arise because something external, not right, has happened. And their first negative emotions indicated there was now an issue of morality. The issue of there is something called right and wrong, good and bad, and it related to their relationship with God. And it is with regard to God that morality has a standard of absolute right and wrong. If we take God out of the picture, without God, morality is subjective. To each person's standard, everybody decides their own right and wrong, good and bad. Yeah, subjective, and the standard of the community that members exist within. So good and right, right and wrong depends on each person, and it also depends on the community that all of us belong to. So in that sense, the community decides, okay, what is right, what is wrong. So in a certain way, community can decide, okay, let's say prostitution is wrong. So we all will not accept prostitution. But, you know, a government over time can say, uh, but we want to control prostitution, right? So we make prostitution acceptable. Uh, you see, the morality changes because the community decides to do something about that issue. And so, you see, the standard of morality can change even within an individual or within a community because there's something they want to get out of that change. And that is normally acceptance or if not full acceptance, condoning. That's to say, it's okay, we'll let it happen. We condone it. All right, so you can see that this right and wrong with human beings, it can change, becomes relative, it's no longer absolute. So the idea of morality, real, real right and wrong can only stand with God if you want to talk about absolute, it doesn't change with times and people's actions and especially the popular vote, okay? Or trying to address a problem. Sometimes governments try to address a problem of, for example, prostitution by legalizing it. Yeah, they're actually trying to address a problem. But that shows that the morality of it is no longer absolute. Okay, so the negative emotions can reveal that our morality has slidden if we take God as the standard. 
Now, Kane and Lamex anger issues also indicated something was not normal, healthy or wholesome in their relationships. Okay, so besides morality, negative emotions also indicate some change, something not favorable, something we may not really like or not really good in relationships with someone else. Their negative emotions led them to an extreme result of murder. Their anger issues hint at the destructive actions that led them, okay, uh, actions that they and people in general might resort to because of anger management issues. Cain and Lamech's anger issues show they were not happy with how they think others are treating them. Okay, so here is the thing about negative emotions. How we think others are treating us. They were not able to manage their anger or expectations and work out a value system or response to manage themselves, regardless how right or wrong others or they themselves are. Okay, they may be right, they may be wrong, okay, but they did not manage to work out a value system and a response to contain their anger and take the right action. So you can see it has a lot to do at times with the issue of whether it's right or wrong. What, were we, what are we going to do about it? Our negative emotions. And that is to say, are they really justified to be angry? And even if they're angry, should they behave in such and such a way in their anger? Okay. But for them, lacking control and anger management, they killed someone. So we can see that Cain and Lamech right? They were angry. Okay, so for us today, it depends on where we stand, whether we agree with their anger or not. Maybe some of us would feel, yes, they should be angry. They are justified to be angry. But even then, is our action, is our response justified? Okay, so how negative emotions actually serve us? We have, we've already learned a lot. We see a lot already, yeah? Now, the negative emotions of the Bible characters indicated that something happened which was not right, normal, or wholesome. There was something not right that they needed to acknowledge and address constructively. Okay, so that is the first uh, important thing they needed to acknowledge and address constructively. However, they let the negative emotions lead them in their behavior or their actions instead of understanding the emotions and choosing to take the most suitable right course of action. Okay, they didn't, I mean, I guess a lot of us, we, or most of us, or maybe even all of us at some point in time, we don't take time to sit down and say, I have this negative emotion. Let me take the time to think about my negative emotions. Right? Yeah, yeah, we don't do that. We just, negative emotions, react, nah. You know, angry, hit out, scold, shout, bang table, throw things, box the other guy. So we don't take that time to understand our negative emotions and ourselves. Yeah? Then we choose the right cause of, or most suitable cause of action. What, what is the, the suitable thing to do? Their negative emotional state caused them to do something not right. And their negative emotions, let me introduce the word, blindsided them. Okay, blindsided. You know what's blindsided, right? Okay, it ba basically means that you kind of like blind you so that you don't see certain things and you just carry on without realizing that. So the negative emotions blindsided them so that they were unable to see clearly and behave rightly to resolve the problem they were actually facing. So they didn't do all the things they should have done instead, the good things. 
it is common uh, that negative emotions blindside people to make decisions and take actions that worsen the situation. You know, right, when we are angry, right, we go there and scold the person upside down. And when we come down, we realize, oops, uh, we did the wrong thing because the person didn't do what we thought the person did. That's an example. Okay, so it makes, it worsens the situation instead of solving or correcting the problem. And this often leads to negative results of misunderstanding. It strains relationships. And if a relationship already further, it strains the relationships further. And it causes people to hurt each other. This is not, now you see why God talks about love and love one another. Because God is telling us, do the reverse. Yeah. At the bottom line, the negative emotions surface the kind of attitudes that were in the hearts of each character. So now we're going deeper. We realize the negative emotions are showing what is in the heart. The kind of attitudes we have in our heart. In general, Cain and Abel's negative emotions revealed a wrong heart. They did not change even though they knew there was something wrong about themselves. The wrong hearts they had revealed a wrong attitude within them that they re refused to change. So here's the thing. Yes, our negative emotions. Do we try to overcome them so that we choose to do the right thing in spite of, let's say, anger? Because if it doesn't, it shows a wrong attitude in us. And we are choosing not to change. In fact, that's where the word stubborn comes in. When people help us to try to help us to see things and we're stubborn, we're actually refusing to change, refusing to see light from another angle. And it's a wrong attitude if we really want to talk about being absolutely right with God and within ourselves. And from there, in our relationships with people. Do we absolutely want to be right in God's eyes? Or do we want to be subjectively right in our own attitude and heart? And that is why they did not address the negative emotions and work at their outward actions and behaviors. Now, this is therefore a significant learning point for us. What do we do with our negative emotions? Do we pay attention to what they're telling us about ourselves? And do we resolve them in a good way, constructive way? What we end up doing from our negative emotions actually reveal if we truly want to do right as God tells us to in his word or in his commands. If not, it shows that all self is still very much alive and in charge. Ah, So now there's another understanding. It is actually our old self that is dominant. We have not put off our old self. Okay? And we are letting the old self kick and punch and we're giving the old self more power to be alive and in charge. And that happens no matter how long we have been Christians or how mature we consider ourselves or consider each other. When in relationship with each other as people or as followers of Christ, how we address our negative emotions and attitudes toward each other. How we choose to cooperate and deny our selfish ways, wants and expectations will give evidence if we are the true worshipper like Abel or the worshipper with the wrong heart like Cain. Okay? So you see how God, amazingly in the Bible, from the very beginning of worship, the first two people who worshipped God, besides Adam and Eve, were their, their sons. Yeah, And the worship of the two sons show the two kinds of worship we can bring to God. The kind of worship that pleases God and wins God's favour, or the kind of worship that does not gain God's favour. Don't be mistaken, Cain is not a, what we call a non-Christian. Huh? If we really think about it, Cain is the equivalent of a worshipper, which means a Christian. 
but whether a Christian who worships God acceptably to gain God's favor. That's another issue. So right from the very beginning of the Bible, God shows us two examples, positive and negative demo. Which extreme or which side do we want to belong to? So do we choose to find fault and or give problems because of our own internal condition? So that's to say, problems come out of ourselves. Do we choose to find fault and give problems because of our own problems inside us? Or do we choose to address the faults and problems we give others? That means the problems that come out of us, do we want to address them so that we are continually being transformed toward Christ-likeness and growing in the true stability and confidence of Christ's esteem? Okay, so this, this is the thing. Problems are within us. Okay, we do have issues within us in our hearts, our internal condition, our inner man. The question is, do we want to continue to let them become a problem and then we find fault outside, you know, with people or with situations and we give excuses? Or do we want to address the faults and problems that we have? And so we try to address ourselves so that we don't continue to give problems. That is something very challenging because it is very difficult to do that when you are the only one or the only two trying to do that while other everybody else is continuing to happily give problems. Yeah, they don't care what's happening, but they just happily give problems. But this is where teaching may be important to help people realize, do you really want to continue being like that? Are you a true worshipper or are you like king? Yeah. Are you a true worshipper that gives God what God wants and gains his favor? Or do you want to be like Cain? The very first worshipper that God shows us wrong attitude, wrong heart, and therefore all your wrong actions. Okay, and we give all the problems out of our internal condition. So we can see, right, God in his wisdom, God is really very wise. He created people to feel, both physically and emotionally, to interact and relate to our world, our others, and ourselves, right? Within, with, even within ourselves, God gives us that emotions to interact, for us to see ourselves. And even our negative emotions, I use the word serve in inverted commas because they do have a purpose. They actually are useful to us. They serve us by being an indicator of our inner condition at any point in time. So here's the bottom line. Huh? Our negative emotions serve us by being an indicator. They are a, can I call it a red flag? Okay of our inner condition at any point in time. So any time that you and I, we feel negative emotions, uh, that's a red flag of our negative emotions. And they're telling us, hello, I'm indicating something to you. That means to myself, to yourself. Okay. Then what are we going to do about it? And this is at every point in time when something flares up and negative emotion comes up. And over time, Okay, so now this is over a period of time. They are a window. That means we can look into ourselves for us to look within to see and know whether we have grown and developed significantly in our journey with Christ, in our journey with ourselves, and in our journey with others. That means those who are family of God and the unsaved who look to us as ambassadors of salt and light of God's kingdom of love. Remember in our discipleship, in our Bible study, we are supposed to be a kingdom of love. And we are supposed to be ambassadors representing God's kingdom of love. And we're supposed to be the salt to preserve it. And we're supposed to be light to shine it, right? For family, other Christians to grow in the same direction and also for the unsaved. So the unsaved can see, oh, God's kingdom is really a kingdom of love. And yes, I do want to belong to it. Okay, 
So over a period of time, whether it's six months, one year, or five years, like we always say, uh, uh, short-term, long-term goals, yeah? The immediate one negative emotions actually tell us at this moment, at this point in time, what am I like? What's my inside condition like? But over a period of six months, a year, three years, five years, 10 years, our negative emotions actually give us that window to see ourselves. Have I grown emotionally, spiritually inside? Yeah, so you can see negative emotions, actually, they are not a bad thing in that sense of they help us to measure and monitor our own development. Okay, something to think about, something to share with people so that people understand and more of us could be on this journey, right? Truly growing deeply and very significantly, making a big impact on our world because this is the wisdom of God for us. So let's take a look at the work of negative emotions. Okay, I'm going pretty slowly today. I don't think I'll finish today's uh, lesson notes, but then I hope we are not in a big hurry, okay? Because we want to really take a depth, an in-depth look at this whole topic of our emotions because emotions are a very big part of our lives. So let's take a look at the work of negative emotions. The negative emotions arise because they are response to something that happens. So I'm going very basic, starting from uh, negative emotions aroused by a word from somebody who says or an action that somebody who does something. Okay, so uh, we can have a negative emotions just because somebody says something or does something. As simple as that. And God did something that upset Cain. So we start from the very first thing. God himself did something and Cain got upset. When God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's. It made Cain angry. Perhaps Cain was angry with God too. Okay, he was angry. Perhaps he was angry with God. We can even say he was jealous of Abel. Right, he was jealous of Abel. Cain compared himself to Abel. So you can see there's another negative emotion, jealousy. Cain compared himself to Abel and hated Abel. I can say that because he went to kill Abel later. And since he could not hit out at God, hit out at the one that you can touch, and that's Abel, and kill Abel. Something similar may happen between us and someone else. Someone says or does something that triggers us, so a negative emotion is aroused. A negative reaction in our emotions causes us to feel something unpleasant stirring inside. Sometimes it could be envy, and sometimes it's a sense of dissatisfaction. And for us, uh, the Hokkien that we like to use is Bue Kam Wan, not satisfied. You know, inside us, there's something I'm not happy. Bue Kam Wan, unpleasant stirring. They can also arise. So besides saying something and doing something, they can also arise because somebody does not say something or does not do something we expect or want them to. So you see, uh, for us, for us to be upset, negative emotions, it can be, you say or you don't say, I also get upset. Yeah. You say or you don't say, I also get upset. You do or don't do, I also get upset. Yeah. That's the way we are. That's the way our whole self is like. There may be people and perhaps each I. Okay, so I want to generalize people and perhaps if we look at ourselves and reflect, I feel upset. I feel hurt or I feel rejected. I think it's important for us to own our emotions. Okay? So I do like to encourage people to use the I. Don't say, you know, when you when you do this, uh, you like this, like this, and then you feel this way. We like to depersonalize and dissociate ourselves with our experiences and with our emotions. But what we are actually doing is we are not owning them. We're not owning our emotions and our experiences. We like to say, you, you know, when you something happens, you feel this way, you do this. We are trying to put it on other people, but we are not trying to own, you see? So for us to make the change for ourselves, I think it's important for us to own our experiences, our emotions, 
and then from there own our own our personal responses and solutions our resolutions okay so i will use an i so there are there are times when i feel upset hurt or rejected when someone i know passes by me without greeting me i put the them in case some people like to uh, please don't associate me together with all these people yeah feel offended so i put the them and stroke me yeah and we may not see that they, those people who pass by us or don't greet us, they may be busy or they may be lost in thought. If then we will say, yeah, but they're not busy. Or they don't look like they're lost in thought, but they still ignore me. Then we feel justified or I feel justified to be angry and or rejected. Or I may feel angry or jealous or rejected because, let's say, uh, Zenny gave Yenny, I make up fictitious names, okay? Zenny gave Yenny a cake, but did not give me any. Yeah, sometimes things, some little, little things like that happen. This person gave that person something, but didn't give me any. And for some of us, or maybe me, I may not be appeased if Zenny suddenly realizes, oh, she didn't give me. And so she comes to me with a cake also. And then I start thinking something suspicious. Why Zenny is now giving me a kick after I have become upset and feel rejected by her? Right? Okay. So she don't do also upset. She do also upset because now I become suspicious. Huh. What is her motive? Huh? What is she trying to say or do? So our negative emotions arise from a situation that disturbs our peace and our expectation. Okay, so this is this is the work of our negative emotions to disturb our peace and to disturb our expectation. Whether people do something with or without good or bad intention. Now, here's another problem that we very commonly have. Ah, oh, they do it because they purposely want to hurt us or purposely want to hurt me. Their intention is bad. You know, they judge me, they criticize me, they condemn me. They are bad, bad Christians or they are bad, bad people. So whether people do something with or without good or bad intention, okay, it, that it should not matter. Because why? Why shouldn't it matter? I'm dealing with myself. Don't I want the best for myself? Don't I want myself to be healthy? Right? So there you go, okay? Whether their intention is good or bad, that is their problem, not mine. Okay, their problem, not mine. Of course, if we are really loving and caring, then we would be concerned that they have good or bad intention. But first, let's address ourselves. We are not out of the woods and we, we bother about people. We are very capable, huh? right? So whether they have good or bad intention, we feel the stirring of negative emotions inside us. And we feel left out. We feel unwanted. We feel neglected. We feel unappreciated uncared for, we feel unloved, we feel that we don't belong. Dot, 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 you can fill in some more. Can you think of some more? You probably can. Huh? Okay. Some people are so full of uh, yeah, la, I always feel like people don't want me, uh, blah, blah, blah and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So you can add in the dot, dot, dot for yourself. These are all signs of insecurity. Okay. Our peace, our expectation is disturbed. And here, we are feeling a sense of insecurity. We are insecure in ourselves. There may be times or moments when we feel vulnerable or we feel especially vulnerable to such low feelings of all these things. We want people, you see, we want to feel precious. We want to feel treasured. We want to feel valuable. We want people to acknowledge, commend, show that they care, show that they acknowledge we are people with a right or a desire to be acknowledged. And it's not totally wrong, although we can be a bottomless pit of uh, need of feeling all these things. So we have to go deeper into understanding, okay? But generally, for normal people, we do have the, the right and we should acknowledge each other. That's why I always encourage people to greet each other. Don't, don't pass by like, like ships in the night and didn't know you exist. Okay? Yeah. 
we should acknowledge each other because why? We are made in God's image. And so that is a biblical fact. We are made in God's image. God didn't make us to be ignored. God made us significant. And so we should acknowledge each other because we are acknowledging what God made us significant. We want to feel our existence is important and we are treasured and precious. So, so in our behaviors, when we don't do all these things, we're actually going against the God truth. That, no, we say we're Christians, but we don't actually act out the God truth that we learn. Now, we may not feel any of these negative emotions all the time. We don't always feel insecure. If we do, then okay, then we have a serious problem. Okay, We have a really serious problem. So we don't always feel these negative emotions. We don't feel it all the time. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Some of us may be able to shake them off quickly. That means our problem is not that serious. We can shake them off. Some of us may not. That means we have a serious problem. They may be intense feelings of rejection or, or feel lousy or whatever, or they may be mild. Depends from person to person. And from time to time, what is our condition when we are vulnerable or we are not vulnerable? Okay, so they indicate that we are vulnerable in those moments or even in longer periods. So in long periods, when we feel down, depressed. Ah, okay. So we're touching on mental health nowadays, right? Okay, we're vulnerable in moments, which is okay, normal in that sense. Okay, or longer periods, then that would be unhealthy. And occasions when we do feel these negative problems or emotions disturbing our sense of equilibrium or balance. So there are times that we feel a, a little disturbed. If it's for a little while, it's normal because our old self, all right, is not always healthy. Yeah, so we feel a sense of this, this disequilibrium and imbalance sometimes. But if we feel it for a long period of time, then that is a, a sign that there's a serious problem that we may need to address. In our vulnerable and unguarded moments, unguarded, huh? when we are not aware or cautious about it, we feel negative emotions stir and cause us to feel isolated, neglected, abandoned, uncared for, lonely, rejected, redundant, useless, and even sorry for ourselves. Self-pity. Uh, we can go down to that stage, okay? Self-pity or depression. Yeah. So that's what can happen with our negative emotions when they disturb our peace or our expectation. When negative emotions of varying degrees disturb us, we may fall into the temptation to dwell on them. Uh, so like Adam and Eve or Cain, right? Cain fell into the temptation to brood Okay, so that's brood. So let me put the word brood. Brood. In response, we may then distance ourselves from the people who may be the cause. This person treat me that way, ma. That's why I'm so upset. We may have some negative thoughts to justify where they are. Now, no longer my good friend or people who care about me. We feel sensitive and that's not in a good way about them. Yeah, so that, that can happen. Don't want to friend them. Don't want to talk to them. They don't come to me. I don't talk to them. I don't friend them. Yeah, we, are, we, we feel things like that sometimes. The rising negative emotions and the beginning of negative thoughts are the flex. I used the word flex just now. That are signaling to them, to us, sorry, that we are on the brink of going into the wrong track. Okay, so if you want to catch yourself, realize it. The flex are the negative emotions, bling, 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 and you don't feel that peace, you don't feel that balance, you don't feel that equilibrium, you know that you're going to the wrong track. And then there is a bling feeling. So it starts as this little chocho feeling, huh? the stuff, the stuff, niggling feeling of upset, hurt, offense, rejection, envy, pain in the heart, bui song, okay? Right, dissatisfaction in the heart. All these are signs of our human nature stirring and trying to gain attention and ascendance. So it's say coming, 
I'm coming up, I'm coming up, gaining ascendance. Okay, I'm becoming prominent. I'm breaking my way out. If we continue to dwell on negative emotions like these and nurse them, remember, sayang, sayang them, we are giving access and license for them to play around with in our thought life. Our thought life, our mind will become the playground. Yeah, the negative emotions go on to arouse sentiments followed by thoughts and attitudes that will divide and strain the relationship between ourselves and the people that we allow these niggling feelings to rise against. And the more we entertain, entertain them, the more they make us keep replaying the thoughts and feelings that make us feel unhappy. But we also feel justified. You know, we feel song. Uh. We feel good to dwell on them because not my fault, it's their fault. Uh. They are the bad people, not me. We think, feel that we are justified to hang on to them and other thoughts and feelings, they make us go on to think and feel. Now, that happens for now. What happens over time? Over time, replaying negative thoughts and feelings form the patterns and ruts. We automatically fall into thinking and feeling. So it becomes a pattern that we just naturally follow. We are becoming negative without realizing that we're also causing our repetitive, keeps repeating, it's also stale and it's stifling thoughts and feelings to become toxic. Toxic, poisonous in our thoughts, feelings, and mind and emotions. We become justified to rehash. So we bring them back like cows, you know, we regurgitate. Huh? We rehash all the negative thoughts and feelings because they cause us to form our own reasoning that makes sense to us. It makes logic within us because we are really toxic and there's a toxic reasoning that works. The toxic thoughts and feelings distort the way we think and reason, but still we think we are right. That's why we become stubborn even when we are wrong. They cause us to doubt others, especially if people don't agree with us. And we begin to wonder why they don't see things so clearly the way we see. You know, sometimes we have something unhappy or sad or angry about someone. We share with a third party and the third party doesn't understand it. Why not? Huh? Why not? Huh? Oh, because we ourselves have formed the logic already. But the third party is not in that poison. You see, the third party doesn't have that, that toxin inside them to, to see the way we see. Coloured wrongly already. Yeah? Such feelings will begin to drive a wedge in our relationships with people if we continue to hold on to these feelings. They will become the eggs. You know, you watch uh, documentaries, science documentaries, very interesting programs. They will become the eggs of harmful parasitic emotions. You know, like some insects, huh? they go into the eggs of, of the eggs or the flowers or, or the buds or the fruit of some, some other animal, okay? And they lay the eggs inside the, the host, host, and then the eggs will hatch inside the host and start eating the host from inside out. Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad you, you can identify that, that there are such programs. And that happens in us. Eggs of harmful parasitic emotions that feed on our negative emotions and thoughts. And they go on to develop and hatch in our attitudes and our relationships. That's why we can become toxic, negative people. In time, it becomes easier to fall into this pattern and habit of behavior. And it develops into a toxic emotional rut that will deepen and become harder to get out of when or if we finally realize it and want to be set free from it. We discover that our habit of toxic thinking and feeling have become a pattern that is very hard to change. We are stuck with it and we really need the power of God to help us okay we can't do it by ourselves to go on with life many of us may convince ourselves we are still okay I'm okay I'm okay you know why because we carry on doing the Christian activities and service ministries that we use as a measurement to assure ourselves we are doing fine with God yeah 
we're doing fine with God, we're doing fine with ourselves, and we're doing fine with others. That means we live in denial. We brush the negative problems aside, we ignore them, and we focus on the good things we are doing. But like I said, the parasitic emotions inside us, inside us, our attitudes and how we think and feel have morphed and not in a God-honoring way. So you can imagine that this is, these are all the aches in stirring inside us while we are playing church with each other. And all the negative sentiments and feelings and the inside inner man that's not healthy, wait for chance and time to surface and do some damage before they go and hide again. Okay, time is up. I'm sorry. So I can't finish uh, quite a big chunk of today's lesson, but I hope we, we have enough good material to go home and think about uh, what we have talked about today and our emotions and thoughts, you know, and make a change that is significant. Very importantly, share with people. Because we don't want to struggle with trying to be good and do all this by ourselves while people are causing problems. Happily continuing with all these things and they, they you know, they, 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 just, uh, they just hit us with all their wrong things. So let's share, help people to understand and people who truly want to worship God like Abel, not like Cain. Cause them to reflect and think. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for your love and for all that you have given to us for life and for godliness. And we pray, Father, Lord, that we will take that time, uh, whether intentionally or even in our moments, uh, when in our busyness and times when we are busy, but we snatch moments when our minds may be still to think about what your word and your truth tells us about ourselves internally so that we are able to continue to grow and develop and change and be renewed. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.